So first I want to introduce you to two people. This is Pedro and Ben. Pedro is originally from Mexico. He's been living in the United States for about three decades. He lives in rural Missouri and he's a grandfather. And Ben is an internet entrepreneur. You might know him from I Can Has Cheeseburger. He's originally from South Korea and he came to the US as a teenager and he lives in California. And what Pedro and Ben have in common is one day they both received the same piece of news that they were going to be deported. I'll get back to them in a little bit. So what is it like to be undocumented in the US? First thing to know is that about a quarter of all immigrants living in this country are undocumented. And it's not just people who cross the border with Mexico, they're people who overstayed visas, they're people who are victims of green card fraud. Anyone can be undocumented, just like the people in these photos. Immigration advocates like to refer to President Obama as the deporter in chief because he's deported so many people under his administration. In the past three years alone, more than a million people have been deported. And as you can see, deportations are up under his watch. Part of the problem is institutional. So Congress actually mandates that 34,000 people stay in immigration detention on a daily basis. Plus, the immigration court system is a bit of a mess. There are half a million cases pending, but there are only 250 judges in the entire country. And the court system receives less than 2% of the funding that enforcement agencies do. So Obama did try to do something about this. Last year, he announced two programs that would have given deportation relief to about 5 million people. But about half the states in the union sued the federal government, and now the programs are on hold until the case makes its way through the courts. So this is what I did to work with this community. The first thing, as Dron mentioned, is listening, trying to figure out what the issues are and what people are really going through. Then amplify those voices and build empathy among our larger audience. Finding ways to show how policies affect real people's lives. And one of the big things I did was try to start conversations between immigrants and non-immigrants. So I did this in a couple of ways. I did a couple of very traditional news stories. I did some work on social media, and I did some collaborations where I worked one-on-one -on -one with immigrants who wrote their own stories in their own words. So one of the stories I worked on was about a little-known federal regulation that prevents tens of thousands of young immigrants from receiving affordable health care. And this is Brenda and her family. She lives in rural Pennsylvania. She was a healthy, happy teenager until one day out of the blue, she had a brain hemorrhage and she's going to be um, disabled for the rest of her life. But because of her specific immigration status, she can't get access to affordable care. So I wrote about this and several other people impacted by this. And it was the most commented story on Al Jazeera America for three days. And a couple of days after the story came out, Hillary Clinton positioned herself on health care for undocumented immigrants. So you might remember Pedro. Uh, I wrote about Pedro for Quartz. And a couple weeks after I did, his deportation was stayed. Um, and his lawyer told me he thinks the story may have had something to do with it. I also wrote another story for Quartz about that aforementioned uh, falling apart court system. And after that came out, the LA Times wrote a very similar story about the same issue. So the big project I worked on this year was My Time in Line, which was a crowdsourced series for Medium, where I'm interning, in which immigrants write in their own words what it's really like to get legal status, whether or not you're undocumented or not, because it's a really complex and difficult process. This became a full-time job for me, making calls, emails, editing, recruiting people, filling out this massive master list. Um, and it was a really exciting project to work on, and there are actually two people in this room who were participants, so thank you, Ellie and Chris. Um, in the end, I got about close to 30 stories with people representing about 25 different countries um, from every continent except Antarctica. So in the next two slides, you'll see photos of all of the different participants. And one you may recognize is Ben. Ben and his family fought for eight years to prevent their deportation, and eventually they won. And now Ben is a citizen. But this was the first time he had written publicly about this or really ever spoken about it. It became the top traffic story on Medium and was one of the top stories for November overall. Um, and just some other numbers, the, 
the series, all of the essays included, received about 60,000 page views, and readers spent about 3,000 hours reading them. Part of the reason it did well was it got some pickup, and I had some partners. So Define American and Forward.us are pretty well-known immigration organizations, and they both help spread the word on social media, uh, promoting several individual stories as well as the series overall. NPR's Latino USA picked up the series um, and wrote about it. Um, and a couple of stories were republished on other sites, including Huff the Huffington Post. I also had a lot of influencers share the story, and that, can, that really includes a wide range of, of people, individuals, uh, organizations, forums. Um, for example, Diane Guerrero, who's an actress on Orange is the New Black, tweeted one of the stories, um, as did Sarah Lacey, who's a very well-known tech journalist. Um, and it generally got some good pickup um, among journalists and the Silicon Valley folk. I also had a really uh, enthusiastic participant who got really into it. He designed this GIF um, for other participants to use. He helps spread the word about other people's essays, and he wants to keep the series going even after the program's over. Um, so I got some good feedback, and, and honestly, this is what was more important to me than the numbers were. Um, so advocates told me that it was a really important uh, endeavor, and that it was done in a very creative way. And non-immigrants told me that they thought they were really inspired by it, and also really helped them to understand what immigrants go through. Sorry. Um, so it's, it's two of my favorites um, that you can see here. What, the first one is from an immigrant, and he told me that he was moved to tears because he could relate so deeply to this little slice of purgatory that he's enduring. And then another non-immigrant uh, non said that it really, he really finally understood what people go through after he read one of these essays, and, and he was really inspired by it. So in doing crowd-powered uh, projects, I learned that you really have to make the participants feel valued and like they have a stake in the project. And that means you have to take on a lot of different roles. You're not just an editor or a fact checker. You're a recruiter. You're a promoter. You're a cheerleader. Um, it's, it really requires a lot of work. And it really also requires buy-in from the organization you're working for and making sure you keep your ask very to the point. Um, the other thing is that as uh, when you're entering a new community, you really need to gain trust. And one way to do that is to find an ambassador who will open doors for you. And my ambassador was Prer Nalal. Uh, she is what I call a badass immigration attorney. She's a former undocumented immigrant, and she was my source on numerous stories, and she also wrote a piece for my time in line. And as I mentioned, it's really important to collaborate because other people helped lift the voices that you are trying to lift. Um, we had Scott Hefferman come into one of our classes early in the semester. He's the founder of meetup.com. And he told us to remember, this is not about you. And I think that's really important when you're doing social journalism and you're working with the community. You have to listen, find out what their issues are, ask for feedback on what you're doing, um, build relationships over time, make sure you're always coming back to them and hearing what they have to say, and experimenting with different things um, to try to get the word out about what are their big concerns. So I think that was my big takeaway um, in terms of why it's so important to listen to people is so that you don't make it about your byline, you make it about the people you're writing about. <coughs> and that's it. Awesome, like for real, this is so good. Uh, we have time for one quick question while Sean's getting his stuff got up, yeah. So when you asked me to write the medium piece, And I'd still like to know, like, why us? Uh, like, why this topic and why, why us? Um, a fair question. Um, I've been working with immigration for a really long time, um, covering it as a blogger. Um, but I think part of the reason is I've always been sort of this outside observer of the immigrant experience, because I grew up in uh, the suburbs in a huge immigrant community in Westchester. I married an immigrant. Um, so. I, it's something that's always been a part of my life, and it's always something that I've been grappling with to try to understand what people go through, and something that frustrated me and inspired the series was that Americans truly do not understand what goes into the immigration process. It's really complex and really frustrating, um, and I 
in my reporting, I really wanted to get that across about what's really happening, because I, I don't think most people really understand it. <laughs>